Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani, and during this lesson we're going to talk about anaerobic cellular respiration, that is, cellular respiration without oxygen. And to understand how anaerobic cellular respiration works, we first must briefly revisit aerobic cellular respiration. So we begin with glucose, and during glycolysis, glucose is broken down into two pyruvate molecules. And during this reaction, two ATP are produced and two NAD plus are reduced into two NADH molecules. And so glycolysis is happening in the cytoplasm of the cell. And those two ATP molecules are used as needed to provide energy for the cell. Meanwhile, the pyruvate goes into the mitochondria where it is oxidized, a carbon dioxide is removed from it, and it is converted into acetyl-CoA. Then enters the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. In the citric acid cycle, the carbons in the molecule are lost as carbon dioxide gas as the molecule is further oxidized, and then two more ATP molecules are released, which then can go on to provide energy for the cell. And by the end of the citric acid cycle, even though the original sugar molecule is gone, we haven't released much energy yet, just four ATP molecules. Most of the energy from the original glucose is in the electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, which are now going to transfer their electrons to the electron transfer chain. Those electrons will go to oxygen, resulting in the formation of water. And so most of the ATP will be made here at the electron transfer chain by oxidative phosphorylation. Between 32 to 34 ATP will be made here. And once that ATP is made and moved on to be used by the cell, the electron carriers once oxidized can then return to glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and the Krebs cycle to be reduced once more and keep aerobic cellular respiration going. So all of this happens when oxygen is present in the cell. And you can review that process in more detail by watching the two videos I posted explaining aerobic cellular respiration. But what happens if there is no oxygen? Or what if the cell does not have a mitochondria at all, like in the case of prokaryotic or bacteria cells that don't have mitochondria? Or if some sort of poison is blocking aerobic cellular respiration at the mitochondria? So in the absence of either oxygen or a working mitochondria, ATP can still be made by the cell, but the metabolism of glucose can only happen during glycolysis. But the problem that we run into doing anaerobic cellular respiration, other than the much lower production of ATP, is that eventually all of the NAD plus available in the cell will be reduced. All those electron carriers that would be able to pick up electrons during glycolysis will eventually be busy carrying electrons, and without an electron transport chain, they will have nowhere to deliver them. Think of it like having only a limited number of taxis available to pick up passengers. If those taxis are delivering their electron passengers to the electron transport chain, then they can return to pick up more electron passengers once they are done. But without oxygen, or without a mitochondria, or if some poison blocks the electron transport chain, then the electron carriers cannot return after dropping off their electrons. And this means that even glycolysis would stop if evolution had not come up with a solution to this problem. And that solution is fermentation. Fermentation is essentially a chemical reaction that will oxidize NADH back to NAD plus in order to keep glycolysis going. So to recap, in the presence of oxygen, the pyruvate molecules produced by glycolysis move on to the mitochondria in aerobic cellular respiration. However, in the absence of oxygen, or the absence of a working mitochondria, anaerobic respiration takes place. This can in turn take two forms. In yeast and some bacteria cells, the pyruvate undergoes alcoholic fermentation. And in animal cells and some bacteria cells, the pyruvate undergoes lactic acid fermentation. The names of these two types of fermentation come from the main products of the reaction. In alcohol fermentation, the main products are mostly ethanol, an alcohol, and carbon dioxide gas. 
In lactic acid fermentation, the product is lactic acid. So let's take a closer look at alcoholic fermentation. This type of fermentation, which is also called ethanol fermentation, produces NAD plus by oxidizing NADH and produces ethanol and carbon dioxide gas as byproduct. So we start with glycolysis, which produces two ATP, net of course, and reduces NAD plus into NADH. The end product of glycolysis is two pyruvate. During alcoholic fermentation, pyruvate is converted into acetaldehyde, a process that releases carbon dioxide gas from the sugar. The acetaldehyde is then reduced by the NADH, which regenerates NAD+, which can be once more available for glycolysis. So alcoholic fermentation is actually a pretty useful process for us. We have domesticated yeast to carry out this type of anaerobic respiration for many commercial purposes. Some yeasts, such as baker's yeast, actually prefer fermentation over aerobic respiration and will produce ethanol and carbon dioxide gas even when oxygen is present. When we make bread, we employ the yeast to make the bread rise by producing bubbles of carbon dioxide gas, which is the point of using yeast for baking. Those bubbles of carbon dioxide gas get trapped in the dough and give bread its spongy, fluffy texture. But this is alcoholic fermentation, so ethanol is also produced. But does that mean that bread contains alcohol? Well, if it did, we would be getting drunk every time we dig into a bread basket, and we certainly would not be packing sandwiches in our children's lunch bag. So, no, it doesn't. First of all, Bread is not intoxicating because the bread fermentation process takes a short amount of time, so only a small amount of alcohol will be produced. But most importantly, any alcohol produced will evaporate during the baking process. When yeast is used to make beer, however, then the alcohol is the intended product of fermentation. The carbon dioxide gas is what gives beer its bubbles. Now let's explore lactic acid fermentation. Like alcoholic fermentation, this type of fermentation also produces NAD plus by oxidizing NADH, but produces lactic acid, also called lactate, as a byproduct. There is no intermediate product and no carbon dioxide is produced. Again, we start with glycolysis, which produces 2 ATP and 2 pyruvate, and reduces NAD plus into NADH. In this reaction, the pyruvate accepts the electron from NADH to regenerate NAD+, which is then available once more for glycolysis. Many bacteria undergo lactic acid fermentation, and we use these bacteria to produce food products like yogurt and certain types of cheeses, as well as many other fermented foods like kimchi or sauerkraut. However, one of the most interesting examples of lactic acid fermentation happens in our own body. Although humans are obligate aerobes, meaning that we need oxygen to metabolize sugars, our muscle cells are able to undergo fermentation to allow them to keep producing ATP quickly when oxygen runs low. You may have noticed this type of fermentation in your own muscles if you've ever felt a burn or painful sensation in your muscles when sprinting or doing too many reps while lifting weights. You feel this burn because muscle fatigue and pain are associated with lactic acid buildup. Lactic acid accumulates in your muscle cells as fermentation proceeds during times of intense exercise. So when you are exercising intensely, your respiratory and cardiovascular system cannot transport oxygen to your muscle cells, especially those in your legs, fast enough to maintain aerobic respiration. So in order to allow your muscles to continue to produce much needed ATP, even when there's not enough oxygen, your muscle cells use lactic acid fermentation. But here's the thing. Intense muscle activity also results in an oxygen debt, which is the amount of oxygen needed to compensate for the ATP produced without oxygen during muscle contraction. This is why we breathe heavy after exercise. This extra oxygen is actually needed to restore ATP and to metabolize lactate. The lactate that accumulates in our muscles is removed by our blood circulation and brought to the liver for further metabolism. In the liver, the lactate is oxidized and converted back to pyruvate or converted into glucose. 
So now we have a better understanding of how cellular respiration works, both when oxygen is present and when oxygen is absent. Talk to you soon.